Today, I would like to talk to you about the paper, which is titled, Why Can Large Language Models Generate Chain of Thought, COT? Uh, this is work we have done in my team um, last year, and it's kind of an attempt of a theoretical study into why uh, large language models are successfully capable of generating COTs or chains of thoughts. So let's start a bit by talking about COTs themselves, right? So what is a chain of thought? A chain of thought is a prompting technique for large language models, and it allows to improve the performance of the LLM by providing demonstrations of some reasoning steps. I think it was originally proposed in this paper, Chain of Thought Prompting Elicits Reasoning in Large Language Models from uh, the uh, BRAIN team, which I think now is a part of DeepMind, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but the idea goes as follows. So imagine you have a pre-trained large language model, uh, which is, you know, like a kind of, uh, you know, it has a tokenizer, embedding, positional encoding, and so on. And then it has like a softmax, uh, which gives us the distribution on the output from which we can sample a token, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is the the it's a pre-trained LLM. Like, take it as for example, GPT four or GPT three point five, or Llama or something that's already pre-trained for us. Now we used to do like a standard prompting where we give it a kind of an example. For example, we say, okay, Roger has five tennis balls. He buys two more cans of tennis balls. Each has a three. How many tennis balls does he have now? And then maybe the, and then once we give that example, we also give it like a prompt question that we want the model to answer. So, which is like a similar reasoning kind of question where we say the cafeteria had 23 apples if they use 20 to make lunch and both six more, how many apples do they have, right? And now we pass through this, um, uh, pre-trained LLM and the LLM will give me an answer. So in this case, the answer would be like 27. I think these are examples coming from this paper. So you could check this paper for more details. So here we can see that the model uh, based on, you know, this example and this question, it was actually, you know, giving us the wrong answer. And in fact, on this data set, which is called GSM8K, which are like different uh, model, uh, different uh, math questions, uh, the model had like a low solve rate of like 33% uh, for a fine tuned GPT 3, 175 billion, and a Palm 540 billion parameters with standard prompting only got 18%. So we can see that it's not doing that well on these types of reasoning problems. Then came the paper, right, where now they actually give it intermediate reasoning steps as additional input, right? So here they say, okay, instead of just putting the input, Roger had five tennis balls, he buys two more cans of tennis balls, each has three tennis balls, how many tennis balls does he have now? Now they also provide the answer to that with the intermediate reasoning step where they say, okay, Roger started with five balls, two cans of three tennis balls, each having six balls, then et cetera, and then the answer is that. And then they provide, you know, the question that they are interested in, in addition to this set of, of uh, reasoning steps or chains of thoughts, uh, which is now the same question we had before, right? So now this is like a step-by-step -step reasoning followed by the prompt question, and now the model will output like a set of reasoning steps, and then it will give me the right number, like the right answer. So uh, what it was able to do is that the model constructed this step-by-step -step solution and then was able to arrive to the right answer uh, to this question. And in fact, doing you know, this, uh, this type of step-by-step -step reasoning was able to improve the reasoning ability of those models on the same GSM8K dataset from like 33% for fine-tuned GPT, uh, GPT-3 of 175 billion and Palm 540 billion to about 57% success rate. And now this is kind of interesting, right? Because if you think about it, what you were able to do is you were able to kind of teach the model to do something uh, uh, reasonably new, uh, which it didn't see before, uh, necessarily see before, by introducing this kind of COT prompting, like this chain of thought prompt. So of course, this goes beyond <clears throat> math questions. 
and it could be like you know for 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 different like type of uh, uh, questions beyond arithmetics and here are some examples of those like you know prompting for coin flips or strategy q and a or for sports understanding and so on always what you will see if you look at these examples is that you will see an input a chain of thought and a set of outputs and chain of thoughts are uh, type of these examples. So, and we highlight them here uh, with this blue color. So, those are examples of chains of thought. Right. So, so this prompting technique, apart from it being interesting and improving the reasoning abilities, both in arithmetic and beyond arithmetic tasks, it's also kind of uh, uh, computationally efficient in a way because we don't really want to fine tune the model. It's just like we kind of give it extra inputs, extra prompts. But the big question is why does COT work, right? Like, 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 how come you know this is this emergent behavior of LLMs actually exists? Like, how come does this happen, right? Because you're not fine-tuning, you know, you pre-trained the LLM on many things, and now you're just gonna test it. But while you're testing it, you're also gonna give it this extra reasoning steps as examples, and then suddenly the model works well. So why? What's the point of that? So we try to understand this question uh, more from a theoretical perspective. And for that, we started by thinking about a, a possible a statistical model of natural language, right? So uh, uh, the statistical model we have considered, so this is kind of our assumption on how natural language works, right? It's like a it's like a statistical model we built, uh, which has some evidence as we give in the paper about why this is a valid statistical model. Uh, but of course, this needs more rigorous empirical studies to actually see whether this statistical model uh, is in accordance right, with the uh, reality of nature language, which we plan to do maybe in the future phase. Uh, but for now, let's just take this as is and some assumption we make, right? So our statistical model <clears throat> has first a variable which describes the context. So the context of the problem we are facing, which is like the context is like a general task descriptor, and that describes the final goal right behind the message we are going to create or we're going to input or we're going to generate. So for example, uh, our context could be about arithmetic demonstration. So now the context of what we're doing is an arithmetic demonstration. So this is a random variable, and it could be other than just you know arithmetic demonstration. But here's just an example of what this context could be, right? So so we have this context. Now this context will also generate intentions, right? So an intention for the first message, right? So the context will generate an intention, which we call theta star x0, right? And that intention is the intention uh, behind the context. And notice that x it's indexed by x0, meaning that it's the intention for the first message. Because we will also assume uh, that these intentions might vary across messages, right? Like now we don't have just uh, one intention, right? Uh, maybe every message has its own intention, right? So our assumption of natural language statistical model is that, okay, there is a context. That context is, you know, like the general description of the task we are interested in. And that context first allows us to generate the intention for the first message. So an example intention could be provide a simple arithmetic problem, right? That's kind of the first intention. Now, from that intention, we will actually generate the message itself, right? So from the context, we are able to generate the intention behind the first message. And from the intention behind the first message, we are able to generate the first message itself. So as an example of this first message is, Alice uh, had two apples, Bob has five apples, Alice ate one apple and Bob ate two apples and gave one apple to John. How many apples did Alice and Bob have, right? So, so the idea is that now we are in a context that's doing arithmetic demonstration, right? And we are in the intention of the first message that is saying, what is the arithmetic problem? And x0 is the first message, which is giving us the problem itself, the arithmetic problem itself. Um, why? Because we are in an arithmetic context and we are under the intention of an arithmetic problem. Now, from this, right, the context itself and the initial intention and the message we have created will actually drive us right to get the next intention for the second message right so here for example 
uh, from theta star x0 and the context C, which is arithmetic demonstration, and the message we created, they all condition us to create the next intention. So for example, an intention of this theta star x1 could be calculate Alice apples after she ate one apple, okay? And now this itself, right, will also create the second message for us. And now the second message, right, uh, could be Alice has two apples, she ate one, now she has one apple, right? So you see kind of what is happening, right? So we have a context that is the general arithmetic uh, demonstration. We have theta indexed by the message, which is the intention behind the message that we're gonna create. And then we have the message itself, all those will condition in order to create the next intention, which itself will create the next message. And then this process repeats, right? The first intention, second intention, context, first and second message will create for me the second uh, intention or the third intention or the third message, which could be calculate Bob's apple after he ate two and gave one to John. And then this itself will induce a message, and that message is Bob has five apples, he ate two, et cetera, how much do we have left? And then this process goes on. So now when we go to the third intention, uh, it's again conditioned, or x uh, theta star x3, is conditioned on theta star x2, the message x2, theta star x1, the message x1, theta star x0, the methods, the message x0, and also the context, which could be now the question of calculate the total number of apples Alice and Bob have, and that will give me the third message, which will give me the answer is a three, and this process repeats, right? So, so to be clear, this is kind of the uh, 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 generative or statistical model uh, that we are assuming for the natural language. It has a context. The context will give me intentions for the messages, and the intentions for the messages will actually give me the message that itself. And now these all, the context, the intention at the previous uh, messages and the previous messages will allow me to condition to get the new intention, okay? So as an example, again, so we had an input message x0, right? Which is saying Alice has two apples, Bob has five apples, Alice ate one apple and Bob ate two apples and gave one to John. How many apples Alice and Bob have? Now notice this is x0 generated by theta star x0, which is the intention of the first message, which is ask the problem. And the problem is conditioned on the context, which is an arithmetic uh, demonstration. So, so that's why X0 is like an arithmetic uh, question. So I'm now from that, right, the, the, the COT thinking, right, is going to be this, doing these intermediate thoughts, intermediate demonstrations, right? It's going to be giving me these intermediate thoughts. So now X1, X2, X3, they are intermediate reasoning steps, intermediate thoughts. For example, Alice has two apples, Bob has five apples, et cetera, and then X3 will be able to give me the output message. Now notice we have a relatively complex model, right? So, so this is a model modeling, you know, how the reasoning happens, if you will. And please notice that the, our model is relatively complex because our model does not assume any Markovian transitions in intentions. In fact, our model assumes a fully connective transition in intentions. It also assumes that every intention is conditioned on the context, but more importantly, every intention is conditioned on the previous messages we have created. Because if you think about it, when you are making a large language model generate for you the next thought, right? Uh, you're giving it all the thoughts you have done so far, right? All the thoughts or all the messages it has created so far. So that's why we allow, you know, these to be fully connected as well. Okay. So that's the statistical model we are going to work with. Now, of course, please notice that in reality, when we have our training data and so on, uh, we don't really observe these intentions, right? Like, we don't know what these intentions are. The question is, will the model be able to create the right thoughts, e abide, or even though we don't observe these intentions? That's the whole idea of the proof, as we will show next. Okay. So just to be a bit more formal about this uh, graphical model, right? We are going to say that the XR is generated from Q 
conditioned on theta star r, right? So this is just saying that, you know, um, to generate x1, you know, you condition on a theta uh, star 1, right, or x1. Uh, so that's why we say the message is generated from the intention according to this distribution q, uh, right? So this is our our... Uh, uh, our generative model is like from this graphical model, we are saying x2 is conditioned on theta star x2, x3 is conditioned on that, and so on, right? And x1 is conditioned on theta star x1. So we're going to say that x, is, which is the you know, kind of the thought, right, is conditioned on the intention uh, q conditioned on the theta star r. And now notice that the theta star r, so now we also want to understand or, or have some notation about the evolution, right, uh, in this intention uh, random variables, if you will. So these intention variables, they are evolving according to the previous messages, right? So previous messages, let's take theta star x2. You notice that this is an arrow to it, x1. And x0 is an arrow to it. So this is xj, uh, 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 the historical xj up to r minus 1. And also the intentions, right? And also the previous intentions. So for this, you also need theta star x1 and theta star x0. And that's why we have this part here. That's the condition in order to get this intention. And of course, we need uh, the context itself, the, the, the true context itself, C star, uh, in order to be able to, you know, have a realization of this variable theta star xi or theta star i. So, so what this is saying is that the evolution of this guy here, it depends on the previous messages, it also depends on the previous intentions and on the context. That's our assumption of the model. Right. We also assume a notion of ambiguity, right? So, so we assume that there exists, you know, a notion of ambiguity uh, about the optimal intention and the optimal contexts, right? About the intentions and the context conditioned on the observed messages, right? Uh, because, and, and this assumption is also not crazy, right? Because imagine I give you a, a, a you know, I give you a set of messages, right? Uh, uh, there is always a form of ambiguity about uh, the hidden uh, context of the question and the hidden intentions of the question that led me to those messages, right? So I introduce this notion of ambiguity where I say that, okay, the probability of recovering C star, the true context, and the true intention behind every message, you know, conditioned on observing the messages is given by one minus epsilon prime, which is a function of those messages, right? So, so here's the kind of ambiguity assumption we are making, that there will be ambiguity, right, uh, on, on, on these uh, hidden context and hidden intentions, right? Uh, uh, th there will be something ambiguous about that. Uh, but we also assume that as your messages go to infinity, uh, we are able to reduce this ambiguity, right? So we're also assuming that the limit as the messages go to infinity, the ambiguity about recovering the context and these intentions for every message tend to zero, okay? Uh, you might not like these assumptions. That's okay. We can discuss them. Uh, please write us in the messages below if you have better assumptions and better model than the one we made. This is our first attempt to understand COT, and we're very happy to improve it. You know, we can do that together. But okay, so far in our paper, right, we assume there exists a statistical model for language. The statistical model has three levels. The first level is a context, the second level is an intention per message, and the last level is the message itself. We also assume that the, message, the intentions between the messages are conditioned on previous messages, previous intentions, and context, and we assume that the message is generated from the intention. On top of that, we said that we have something called an ambiguity, and that ambiguity is about the probability of recovering the true context and the true intentions given you have seen messages. So, because in reality, in the real world, in LLMs, we're gonna only know the messages, right? And now from the messages, we wanna know something about the context and about the uh, intentions. And then we said that this ambiguity will, uh, the error in this ambiguity will go to zero, as the number of messages go to infinity, okay? 
Now, <clears throat> what is really uh, what is really going on, right? Okay. So, so now the first thing is we're going to borrow uh, some results, right, uh, from the following two papers. One is called a latent space theory for emergent abilities in large language models. And the second one are transformers universal approximators of sequence to sequence functions. Okay. Uh, what these are going to say, they're going to show that an LLM, given enough training, right, uh, uh, and given enough data, it's going to be able to become a universal density approximator. So they actually prove this, you know, in these two papers. Okay. But now let's just be clear about a couple of things, just some more notational things, right? So when I am telling you the distribution over X, meaning the distribution over my messages, like let's say I have X1, X2, up to XK, right? If I will tell you what's the distribution according to this, we are going to assume a standard autoregressive model, a standard autoregressive distribution. So we're going to say that the Q of X is nothing but the Q of X1, then the Q of X2 condition on X1, then the Q of X3 condition on X1, X2, up to Q of XK condition on X1 up to XK minus 1, right? So now, so now this is just the standard autoregressive factorization of a sequence of length K, right? So if I have a sequence of length K, uh, my Q of X, right, is going to be just factorized in this way, okay? So the, to, to get the token, you know, XK, you condition on everything else. So that's the statistical model that we have used. It has a density that looks like this, okay? And now the LLM itself, right, will also be an autoregressive model, as we all know. So now LLM of this X will again be nothing but a parameterized LLM by theta of X1 multiplied by LLM of theta X2 given X1 up to LLM of theta XK given all the history. Uh, so uh, please notice the notation here. When we write LLM of X, we also mean it's like the, the kind of the distribution, right? Imposed or induced by that LLM. And the LLM is parameterized by theta. So this would be like the weights of your transformer, key, value, and so on. But now, what, 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 the, what the people were able to show in this work, right, is that the as your number of data grows to infinity, right? So as n grows to infinity, yeah? LLM, the distribution induced by the LLM under theta star with n going to infinity will actually recover the natural language distribution and therefore we will have a universal density approximator. So just keep this in mind that the whole idea uh, from these works, I mean, or not the whole, maybe one of the ideas from these works is that they were able to show that the LLM can become a universal density approximator given enough training of the optimizer and given enough data. So they were able to show that as n goes to infinity, the parameterized distribution by an LLM will recover the true distribution or the true density of the uh, natural language. Okay, so let's recap this slide a bit, right? So uh, what this slide is saying, okay, imagine the true language has a, uh, a uh, imagine the true language has an autoregressive distribution like this. And imagine we have a distribution parameterized by an LLM, which has these parameters theta. If you give me enough data points, and if I am able to find theta and star, then as n goes to infinity, I am able to recover the true autoregressive underlying density of natural language. That's all it says. Right. So now, what is our problem, right? Like, let's go back to the COT setup, you know, and try to understand what is our problem. Okay. So imagine, right, we have a pre-trained LLM. As we said, you know, that's how COT works. We have a pre-trained LLM. And, and now, and therefore now we say it's LLM of theta star, right? Because it has been, been pre-trained. And now on top, right? On top of my input prompt X0, right? I also give a collection of exemplar COTs, like a set of examples of COTs about intermediate reasoning steps, okay? Now, uh, I call these COTs as this matrix ZK, 
which is made zk0, zk, mk. For k equals one to n, right? So this is like a set, you know, uh, of uh, uh, a set of uh, COT examples, right? So zk, uh, big matrix zk is one uh, kind of uh, like a set of thoughts. And I have big N of those thoughts, so to say. So this is just the notation to say that I inputted to my LLM extra examples of COTs, okay? Which are denoted in our case by this CK from K equals one to N, okay? So I have a pre-trained LLM, right? And I start from some prompt, X zero, right? My initial message. And I additionally give a set of COT examples, K equals one to N. Now, I will automatically make the LLM to start to generate thoughts, right? So from this, I want the LLM to create the first thought, then autoregressively create the second thought, then autoregressively create the third thought, and so on up to the M thoughts, right? Because that's kind of the COT setup, right? Like you start with this set of examples, and then you let the LLM run. So it will start by creating a first thought, then it will regressively, second thought, third thought, and so on, until it gives you the answer at the end. And again, this is a pre-trade LLM. So here notice, again, that theta star is the limit as n goes to infinity of theta star m. So imagine a pre-trained LLM on a lot of data, which is not unrealistic, to be frank. And now here, right, notice that this Z uh, is what we said as the example of chain of thoughts, right? So mathematically speaking, right, the ZKR is sampled according to our assumption of how the natural language looks, right? It is sampled from Q. So this is the message, right? The message ZKR, thought ZKR is sampled from Q, conditioned on the intention, right? And ZKR itself, the intention, is conditioned on the historical messages and the historical intentions and the context C star. So where does this come from? Remember our model, right? So Z will be sampled from the theta. Uh, theta uh, will be sampled, conditioned on C, the old theta, and the old message, where now we call it Z, and that's kind of the intention for us, okay? <laughs> okay. So that's what we are inputting, right? And now X0 is the initial prompt, as we said. And now XM, right, is the uh, sequence of thoughts, as we described, that will be generated. Again, now notice, <laughs> according to our, you know, natural language uh, model, statistical model assumption, uh, the message XR is sampled from Q, given the intention theta star, and theta star is sampled from Q, given the context and the previous intentions. Nothing really fancy, right? So again, this is just saying, um, I have a set of thoughts that are sampled according to my statistical model of nature language, and the LLM will proceed to generate these thoughts as well uh, that you know uh, are sampled from the uh, 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 from itself autoregressively. Okay. Now notice two things, right? The LLM itself could generate thoughts. <laughs> And the true language, uh, the true natural language mo statistical model can generate thoughts, right? So knowing the true intention, right, and the true context, the true natural language can generate optimal set of thoughts, x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, up to xm star. Our LLM only being pre-trained and knowing this set of COTs can it generate for us the optimal X1 star, X2 star, X3 star, Xn star, uh, Xm star? So that's the question, right? If we are able to show that the LLM, without knowing the intention and the context, right, just from a sequence of set of thoughts, uh, COT, right, and an input prompt, it could generate a sequence of thoughts which is optimal, right? with respect to the true natural language, then that's some thumbs up. And then we know why the LLM is creating what it's creating. So in other words, right, the natural language prediction is given by this CQ of XR, R equals one to M given X zero and C, right? 
that's the true kind of nature language coming from the nature language. So C is arithmetic demonstration. And now the LLM is itself generating, you know, uh, this XM up to X1 conditioned on X0 and C, right? Itself, it's generating those, yeah? Now the goal is to see whether we are able to say that whatever the LLM is generating and whatever the true natural language would have generated, right? If we can say that those two things are close to each other. Right. So if we're able to say that those two things are close to each other, right, then we are able to showcase that an LLM is capable of generating the correct thoughts that would have been generated by the true language, which we assume the statistical model. Okay. And in fact, the main result of our paper shows exactly this. So under the ambiguity assumptions we mentioned above, so the idea is that if I give you messages, you cannot recover exactly the context and the intentions. You have this error, but this error will go to zero if I give you infinite number of messages. And for a long enough exemplar of COT, we have that the limit as n goes to infinity of the distance between whatever is generated by the LLM versus whatever is generated by the true uh, natural language would actually go to zero, right? That's what we are able to show. So notice that the LLM without knowing the context nor the intentions versus the true natural language, which we assumed is statistical model, will tend to zero as n goes to infinity. So for long enough COTs, we are able to show that x, m, x1, x2, up to XM from the LLM, uh, their distribution versus that that is coming from the natural language will go to zero. Okay, so in other words, the prediction of the LLM and the prediction of the na nature language will asymptotically be the same. So uh, what we are also able to show is that starting from some length of ZK, the convergence becomes geometric. So we are able to show, right, that uh, from a specific length n, you know, this distance, right, uh, between whatever is generated by the LLM and whatever is generated by the true language will be less than c rho to the power n for some rho in zero and one. So we are able to uh, uh, to show that this is uh, uh, true. Uh, uh, you will have a geometric uh, uh, bound uh, when uh, you know for for kind of a big enough n. So in short, what this paper was able to show under our assumptions, which you might agree with, you might disagree with, and that's fine. If you disagree, I will be happy to learn why you disagree, and we can try to improve this work. But under our assumptions, right, an LLM prompted by long enough COTs is capable of generating the correct thoughts that would have been generated from the true language abiding by our statistical model. I think that's the main story kind of of this whole paper. So there are many things that we, we 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 want to improve. One is kind of our assumptions. Two, there is still a gap to reality because in reality, we don't have infinite length or very long length COTs, but they still work. So now the question is, can we do uh, better you know, than our analysis? Uh, but uh, this is the paper. I think it's really an interesting theoretical attempt to understand you know, why LLMs can generate COTs. I hope you like it. Please feel free to like this video, share it, and also subscribe to our channel if you find the material that we are doing is useful. Uh, so if you have any other uh, comments about our assumptions, please let me know in the comments below. I'll be very happy to have a discussion and maybe even work together. So thanks a lot, and I will see you next time.